We'll be taking up our offering at this time. Today's offering is for our local church budget here. So our money will stay here and take care of our financial needs to help us be able to have meetings like this filled with people that I don't recognize at all. <laughs> and I think that's great. We also have a basket in front. Young people we be passing throughout to collect money for the worthy student fund that we support. And I used to say that the little lambs would fleece the flock. <laughs> there will be a children's story immediately after the offering is taken up. And we re also need to remember our building fund for the new facility that we're planning to build. We have a matching fund that we matched last this last year up till June 30th. We have another year to go for our next uh, matching fund, which is $100,000. We need to remember that. If the deacons would stand at this time, I'll have a prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can return our tithes and offerings. We ask that you'd guide and direct them for their intended use. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. for the Worthy Student Fund.
It's so awesome to see so many children. It's great. Where I live in Tennessee, the children can't come forward to, to hear the children's story right now unless they're a part of the children's story. So we've had children go up with their moms and help tell the children's story, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, just take a seat anywhere along the stairs. We can sit on both sides if there's not enough room. I'll just step a little further back so I can see all of you, and hopefully you can all see me. All right, everybody. Everybody's getting settled in. Isn't this wonderful? Well, I am sure that there are some of you that were here last year, and I, I am sorry, but I can't remember what story I told last year, and I didn't write it down. So I'm going to have to start doing that. So if you've heard this story already once, just pretend you didn't, okay? Then I'll feel better. Okay, so the story is from Mindoro in the Philippines. It's an island, and it's from up in the mountains of Mindoro. And there was a man there that owned a water buffalo. Now, any, any of you seen pictures? I'm sorry, I didn't get my pictures this morning. You've seen pictures of a water buffalo? They're big. They're very big. And they can be quite scary because they all have horns, right? And so this man's water buffalo, he was out in his field, and um, he tied the water buffalo up out there. And um, he left her there and went back to the village for a little bit. And somebody came running and said, your buffalo died. She's there on the trail, on her back with her legs up in the air, and she's dead. And so he was like, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to go out there and we're going to have a big feast because, you know, now we have water buffalo we can eat. So he goes and he takes all of his knives or whatever and so he can make water buffalo meat and they can have a big feast. And he gets out there and he's like, you know what? I learned about Jesus. And I think Jesus can do something a little bit different than make a big feast with this water buffalo. And so he's like, Jesus, I've learned about you, but most of my neighbors don't know about you. And so I ask that you will heal my water buffalo from the dead so that they will know about you. And he's like, waiting, nothing happened. Hmm. So he prayed again. Jesus, please, these people that I live near, that all live all around me, they need to know you. Please raise the water buffalo from the dead. Nothing happened. So he opened his eyes and he's like, hmm, well, I'm just going to roll her down this hill then. And he took a big shove and pushed. And she rolled over on her feet, got up and started chasing him. And he ran over and climbed up a tree, and then he hears other villagers coming. They're calling, have you started cutting her up so we can have a feast? And he's like, don't come any closer. She's not dead, but she's angry. <laughs> and so then she gets up, and she's there at the bottom of the tree, and he's looking down, and he's going, what now? Jesus raised her from the dead, but she's so angry. And so then he had another prayer, and he says, dear Jesus, you raised her from the dead. Thank you. But she's angry. Please heal her attitude. <laughs> and he waited there, and pretty soon she put her head down and started walking away and looking for some grass to eat. And he climbed down from the tree, and he called to the other villagers and said, It's okay. You can come. Jesus raised her from the dead, and then he healed her from her bad attitude. And so the villagers all learned more about Jesus that day, that Jesus can not only raise the dead, but he can help us with our bad attitudes. And sometimes, I know I struggle with having bad attitudes. Sometimes I get angry like that buffalo, but you know what? Jesus is bigger than all of our attitudes. He's bigger than our sadness. He's bigger than our anger. He's bigger than all of our attitudes. And so every time we feel a little bit out of sorts, Guess who we can ask for help? Because he can heal our attitudes too, can't he? Let's have a quick prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you can raise the dead. You have power over death. 
And not only that, you have power over our attitudes. We just ask that you will help us to be cheerful and helpful and happy and that you will help us to remember if we are out of sorts or we see someone else out of sorts, we can ask you for help and you are always there to help us. Please bless all of our young people today and thank you that we can have faith camp together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go back. The scripture reading for today is John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. It's John 14, 12 to 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. This song is talking about Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That is amazing. Thank you so much. It's like the beams of heaven shining on us through song. That's awesome. You know, we've been in this long enough, this missionary business, business, long enough to know that it's not just us. Um, when we first started out, I was amazed at how much joy and pleasure and excitement and fun we were having serving God. And now I'm seeing many other people having fun, joy, excitement, serving God with tribulation. But what's interesting, we always talk about the tribulation and serving God. I experienced more tribulation when I wasn't serving him. When I was serving my own will, when I was serving what I, doing what I wanted to do, I was absolutely miserable. And I was bored and miserable. And my conversion experience happened in the back of a pickup in Cambodia, 1996. You know you're getting old when you mix up decades. <laughs> I got that one right. And I heard an AK-47 go off behind me. Ba -ba 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 -ba. This was when Pol Pot was still alive. And I thought, what if those bullets hit me in the back of the head? And I realized, you know what, that'd be okay. Because right now, this moment, I'm serving God. And I realized I'd rather die serving God than live serving self. Because living, serving self is kind of kind of a living death. Kind of selfish, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, one announcement. This afternoon, we're having a youth panel. A little change in our program. Youth panel, we're, we want to start about 10 minutes early, so about 2.20. So that gives you about, 40, about four minutes to eat lunch by the time I'm done. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so we'll start with uh, song service and then go into a panel. And then uh, Sister uh, Lundby, uh, um, Miranda Lundby, who will soon be my daughter-in-law. Would you like to stand? No, you just stand. <laughs> Please stand. Thank you. This is my privilege of embarrassing her. Thank you very much. <laughs> and James is watching, yes. <laughs> my son is watching. So, um, so 2.20, uh, and then we'll go into her. She's speaking uh, at that, in that same time frame, and then we'll go into the 4 o'clock meeting with uh, the, uh, the Howell family, wherever they are. Okay, anything else? Okay, Faith Camp Offering is this evening, right? Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I chose this flattering photo of Tim <laughs> with his human. No, <laughs> no, Tim is the human. Um, Tim uh, is a good friend. He's one of our inspirations. He's, uh, he, he's, he, he moved to Cambodia, oh my goodness, over 20 years ago. And uh, he's been there ever since. Um, and he's one of those guys that I don't understand. Um, he scares me. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, uh, he was called to put all of his resources, all of his savings and everything into an incarnational ministry. And incarnational means that you become like the people you are serving in as, as, as many ways as possible. So he learned the language. He moved out into a piece of land um, and built a a shack, a, a grass shack, and that's where he lived with his family for a while. He invested all of his money into that land. And the Lord told him, don't ask for money, don't do any fundraising, just come and talk to me. I'll, you do the work and I'll take care of you. And that was 20 years ago. Uh, about four or five years ago, he, came, he, he told me that the land that he purchased for $15,000 is now worth $15 million because he's right near Angkor Wat. Has anybody been to Angkor Wat? You heard about Angkor Wat? Okay. It's, uh, about, it receives about 3 million visitors per year. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. It's one of the few man-made structures you can see from space. It was built in about 1000 AD, so it's old. And he lives 15 minutes from there. And so I says, why don't you sell it, go build somewhere else, and you still have $10 million in the bank. He says, yeah, but who's reaching the, who's reaching the tourists? And so he says, I want to build something that will uh, reach the tourists. I want to be on the tourist track. And he says, I want to build a butterfly aviary. And I'm like, how much is that going to cost? He says, oh, about $350,000. I'm like, I didn't say this. I've learned to not voice my doubts. <laughs> but I, and I was thinking, there's no way. There's no way. He could barely meet his $10,000, $11,000 a month 
uh, operating expense. How are you going to do that? And so I didn't say anything. I was like, okay, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> a month later, somebody sold his second house, donated $160,000 towards his thing. So I'm glad I didn't say anything. But this is a testament of faith and what God can do today. Tim made some bold and radical decisions in his life. He quit his job, moved to a foreign country with his family, and invested their money in starting a ministry. Leaving their lives in Australia behind, Tim and his family purchased a piece of land in Siem Reap, Cambodia, wanting to establish a place of hope and healing for the community. They started a school to help kids from poor families. They also organized programs to help families earn an income. Aside from helping families, Tim built small houses within their property to serve as a shelter for young men and women who don't have a place to stay or those without family. Prayer has been a vital part of Tim's daily activities. After living in Cambodia for many years, he prayed for a new, unique way to introduce people to God. After months of earnest prayers, God answered Tim's petitions and helped him establish a butterfly farm that was available to the community and tourists as well. Butterfly Paradise is about helping visitors, local and international, experience the beauty and design in nature and therefore come to see the need for a designer. And we want to, them to see that that designer is God, the God of Genesis chapter 1, who created all things in six days. The beauty of nature is a unique way to attract visitors and introduce the topic of creation. The butterfly paradise allows people to gain a deeper understanding of God's wonderful creation. And so when they come here, then we will be seeking to draw them to God. We have a cinema here, and as they come into the air-conditioned cinema and get out of the heat, then they will be introduced to the theme of design in nature and God as designer. We have a vegetarian restaurant and we hope to use the vegetarian restaurant there as a way of helping people see that their designer had a particular diet in mind so they could maintain good health. Then we have an educational area where people can learn about the life cycle of the butterfly. They realize the complexity of the life of the butterfly and that again there's a designer involved. The final stop is at the souvenir shop. Here, guests can bring home memories of their unique experience in nature. The funds from the shop help to run the operations, but not everything has a price tag. There is free literature to take too. The Butterfly Paradise is not only reaching out to the public, but it also reaches in to every staff member. They may find a deeper understanding of the Bible and a purpose to serve other people. Butterfly Paradise is staffed with young people that have come through our orphanage and come through our school. And so these young people, they've learned about Jesus in the orphanage, in the school. And so we're giving them an environment where they can continue to grow in Christ, where they can have Sabbath off, and where they actually get to share their love for God with other people. And so as they go through this experience, their own salvation is strengthened and renewed daily. Saraya came from a poor family. Tim enrolled her in their school. At this institution, she learned about the Bible and was drawn closer to Christ. Then she accepted Christ into her heart and was baptized. I have learned uh, so many things from this place. I have education, how to cook, yeah, how to mango with, God, uh, with people, and how to um, do evangelism, give the Bible study, and now I have a job, and I have a family, and thank God for this place. Please pray for Tim and the Butterfly Paradise. This supporting ministry is a positive influence in the city of Siem Reap. Please pray that more young people will get the chance to have a good education and a deeper understanding of their purpose. Yeah, okay, so this next uh, video is from my friend um, Scott Griswold. Those of you that are interested in going overseas and want to get a little training, don't feel like you can go. There's not very many mission schools, There's not very many schools for missions. Uh, there is an academy that's designed to produce missionaries, 
And there's a booth right out here on the left as your exit, right out there on the left, um, that's, designing, uh, that's designed for missionaries. And is uh, the Donovans here? It's called Mission Creek Academy. Uh, okay, there's Heidi Donovan right there waving her hand in the back. And her husband Chris is around somewhere. And so, sorry? It's Heidi's birthday? Okay, well, we're going to have to embarrass her too. <laughs> All right, for, no? Okay. <laughs> we have three songs we like to sing, but we'll avoid that for now. We'll get you later. Okay, so this is a school for, um, now, Scott Griswold works, uh, it's a unique joint effort between the Texas uh, Conference and ASAP Ministries. And they're joining together to do missionary training. Scott spent, I don't know, 10, 15 years in Cambodia and Thailand. Um, and so without further ado, I'm just going to play this right now. At our property in Texas, we have a little chapel in the woods. And here we have the three crosses. I love coming to this place, and I especially like the fact that the pulpit, the place to speak from, is by the repentant sinner's cross not there by the cross of Jesus, not worthy to be there, but this place where the one who felt his need cried out for salvation and for help. The story of Jesus on the cross is the most amazing story in the world, and it is powerful to share with those who have never had a chance to know the love of God. But for many people, they look and they don't understand. There are Muslims who assume that Jesus would never have died on the cross and was taken up to heaven before that. There are Hindus and Buddhists who who don't understand how someone who seems to have such bad karma can be the one that we worship. It seems like it's foolishness and a stumbling block, just like Paul said. But Paul went on to say it's also the wisdom and the power of God. He said it's so important, so special, that he determined to preach nothing else except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What about you? Are you ready? Are you willing to share this beautiful and most precious story with Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, and the secular people that live around us? Are you spending time with Jesus so that it fills your heart with love overflowing and you know it is the answer for the problems of people? This is what we need to do. Jesus wants to come back, but he is determined he will not return until every nation, every tribe, every tongue has had an opportunity to hear his story and respond to his invitation to receive forgiveness, to receive the transformation of the heart, his power over evil. We have developed an online training program called Reach the World Next Door, where in 13 sessions, you, your family, or a church group can go through and understand better how to share the love of God with immigrants, refugees, and international students. I hope you will take time to learn from that and to get out there into the community so that together, we can reach the world ASAP. Texas. So if you want to go there and learn how to do gardening and do, and do practical, they take you into the city and reach, um, do cross-cultural mission work with all the different people groups from all over the world there in Texas, different languages and things like that. So I recommend getting involved with that. It's very good. Okay. Um, here we go. So, I don't know, probably most of you know this quote. You know that the situations that have, that's been taking place and developing over the last few months uh, has kind of heightened our concern about uh, and, and sensitivity to the gospel and the prophecies of the end of the world and the end game scenarios coming up. Um, one thing that we don't often talk about in our church is the key component to the end of the world taking place. Um, this highlights that component, the work, the, the work that which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. I think we're kind of entering in and tasting a little tiny taste of some forbidding, discouraging circumstances. Uh, but it seems as though there's a certain amount of work that needs to be done before, I mean, it has to be done, whether it's done when it's easy or done when it's hard. There's still the same amount of work. When I tell my, well, when I used to tell my four-year-old son when he was four to go clean his room, there was a certain amount of work that he had to accomplish 
before he could eat dinner. Okay? And so whether he did it when in prosperous times when daddy was smiling at him or in difficult and discouraging times when daddy was no longer smiling at him, he still had to clean it. He had a certain amount of work to be done. And this is the same thing with the church. Okay. Now, I want to switch gears. I want to talk about where we are in our culture. Okay? Every church develops a culture. All right? We are people of the book uh, in a lot of things. Uh, in some things, not so much. And we've developed a culture... And not necessarily that we disbelieve or, or we discount certain parts of the book, is that, but rather that we find some parts of the book more appealing and we spend more time there and we have more emphasis there than other parts of the book. Okay? And so what happens is, over the course of many generations, you get kind of a pattern, a normal habit of thinking, a um, normal pattern of, of the topics that we preach about, and the normal kind of, of flow. And this, this is like an inertia. This is a culture that's an inertia. And so as you become an Adventist, as you grow up as an Adventist, there's a certain culture, there's certain unwritten expectations of how you're supposed to think, live, eat, what your expectations are towards, you know, what you have to do to not rock the boat, so to speak. And that culture has developed over the last few generations in a direction that is healthy in some ways, not so healthy in other ways. Okay? And we're going to look at a blind spot that is developed in our culture today. Okay? The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. What does it mean, imputed to us? Given. Given is yours. Okay? It's just yours. Given. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is given to us, not because of any merit. What's merit? Worthiness. Worthiness. We don't deserve it. On our part, but as a... Free gift from God. That's a precious thought. The enemy of God, okay, that's Satan, and man, that's our enemy, is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. So there's something special about this message. Very special, and we need it. If he can control minds. So what's Satan after? My mind. My mind. Yeah, our thoughts. If he can control that, so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. Faith is the victory. Amen. Faith in God's word. That's where the victory is. Once you get it there, once you get that there, once you get this message, that right there, in your mind, and you walk, in, and we're going to talk about this. Okay, the third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have, have been... Now, she's taught... This is in her time. This is like back in the 1880s, 1890s. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to, sub, to express this subject in its fullness. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. The sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, it presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the... Okay, so, whoa. There's a... There's a... There's a... There's a... There's a, there's a what do you call it? Sequence. There's a sequence here. First step is invited people to receive the righteousness of who? Christ. Christ. We can receive his righteousness. Does anybody here think Christ was righteous? Amen. Amen. 
Amen. He was in favor with his father. Wouldn't you say so? We can receive that by faith. Faith is the victory. We can receive that by faith. And then that is manifested in what? All the commandments of God. Now, when we think of all the commandments of God, we think of all the Ten Commandments of God. There's a lot more than that. It's all one, though. What about the command to go into all the world? Is that a commandment? To love the least of these, my brethren, people that are so least, we don't even know who they are? What about them? I want to do a little... I don't really want to do that right now. Yeah, I will. Okay. Does anybody know the name of an unreached people group? You do. He's been praying for an unreached people group since last year. We have cards here. We can pass those out now. Uh, each card has the name of an unreached people group. You can take it and you can pray for them. And don't think your prayers go unheard. Because the entire weight of the mission work in God's church is dependent on the prayers of his people. Okay? Okay. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. What are we? Helpless. He's not helpless. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. What's the message? That all power is given into his hands and he can dispense, he can give those gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness. His own right doing. His own right standing before God unto men. That's amazing. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Whatever our profession, it amounts to nothing unless Christ is revealed in... What? Works. Now... See where, where we are. Okay, I'm going to start. I grew up in the church. I was born and raised in the church. I love this church. It has the truth. But the culture that I grew up in, maybe, maybe it wasn't the culture, maybe it was just me. I don't know. But my whole life, I always had this picture in my mind. Okay? God's righteousness, His acceptance, His and holiness was over there. And I have to keep the Ten Commandments to get there. <laughs> well, she's saying no, but that's the way I grew up. That if I keep the Ten Commandments and do all the right behavior and not rock the boat, that eventually I will, ha- I will come into holiness. And that if I break the Ten Commandments, then I'm way over here and I have to work my way back into acceptance by God. Did I have a wrong picture? You would be amazed at how many people I've talked to that have that picture. I asked one of my young friends, he was eight at the time, I says, how do you see, how do you think God sees you? How do you think he sees you? He said, I think he's kind of annoyed. (laughs) Which is cute, but I think that a lot of people keep that same viewpoint of God, how he sees them through into their adult life. It was only about three years ago that I started to realize that God is happy and that he's well pleased with us. Can you say from the bottom of your heart that you know that God is well pleased with you right now? I think a lot of us struggle with that. Number one, the song, God is a, you know, he's a good, good father. I struggled with that. I knew he was good, but is he a good father to me? Because a lot of things he seemed to do to me, I would have 
done differently. I wasn't sure he was really good because I look at my life and it's like some things good happen and some things bad happen to me. If he was a really, really good father, it seems like it would all be good. <laughs> so I was kind of like not sure about what, you know, if he was really, really, I knew he was my father and I love him. Is he a good father? Huh? Until just a few, just recently, I've started to stumble upon how he sees me and that he is a good, good father. We get sidetracked by the difficulties that we fall into during our life. Jesus went to the cross. He had difficulties in his life. If you look at the life of Jesus alone while he was on this earth, you wouldn't see a good, good father. He took him through difficulty, took him through trial, and eventually he was slain on the cross. That does not look like a good father until you look at the big picture. Jesus did not stay on the cross. And this was hard for me. Because I thought that serving Jesus was suffering. Serving Jesus equals suffering. Jesus suffered. There's no doubt about that. But why did he suffer? Hebrews 12.2, for the joy that was set before him. Suffering's not the end result. Suffering's not the goal. Suffering's temporary. The end result is bliss, pleasure, joy, forever. Suffering is as a result of sin. And we tend to look at, we, I look at my life events to define who God is rather than what God did for me 2,000 years ago. And when I get into a moment where somebody may be trampling on my rights, I look at that and I respond. That defines me. And I respond in anger instead of looking at what God has done for me and allowing that to define me. He loves us. He he loves me. He gave his life for me. That is the defining moment of who I am and who you are. That settles 100%, no questions asked. God is love. God has a plan and he's out to save us. So if God is willing to give his son to save us, he's willing to give anything. In fact, that cross, that Jesus dying on the cross was a revelation of the principle that continues to live in the Father's heart. Which which means if he needed to go to the cross again to save us, he would do it again. This is the kind of God I want to serve. This is, he's not holding back. He's all out. An unwillingness. So this message came to our church in 1888, around then. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that, longed to imp- that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from attaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world. What is that inf- efficiency? Holy Spirit, yes. The Holy Spirit and this message. Christ, our righteousness. As the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost, the light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. That's a big key to the culture that we live in today. That's the culture. Okay. All right. The law is our schoolmaster. Galatians 3.24. The law, law is, was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. In this scripture, the Holy Spirit, through the apostle, is speaking especially of the moral law. This was the sticking point back there, because they had preached the law, preached the law, preached the law. It was salvation by obedience. And we come to God through obedience. We come to God through obeying his law. We come to God through the Ten Commandments. 
Rather, what, and the thing that they wouldn't accept was that the commandments point us to Jesus. No one can gain any kind of merit. No one can gain any kind of holiness. No one can gain any kind of righteousness by obeying the law. Why? Because we can't obey the law. We don't have within us the resources to obey a holy law because there's nothing holy within us. We don't have those materials. We can't do it. We can try. We can come close. We'll never do it. It's a law of love. It's a law of holy. It's a holy law. There is no holiness within our natures. There's nothing within us that can do that kind of thing. That's like saying, to, you know, asking, asking my wife, I want you to uh, jump from the bottom of the Grand Canyon to the top in one leap. She doesn't have within her makeup the ability to do that. And keeping the law in all its holiness, in all of its facets, in every moment of your life, you don't have the ability to do that, and neither do I. So what's the solution? Stop trying. See how this is still sticking on us. Does that mean we become liberal? No, because liberal is just a shorter list of things we have to do to satisfy God. I say, let's go to the source of that law, like this is saying, take the law and say, oh, I'm a sinner. Where do I find righteousness? I find it in Christ. He kept the law 100% holy from the beginning of his life until the end. And then he was killed and that was sealed. His righteousness, his righteous life was sealed by his death. And now he takes all of that and he says, would you like it? <laughs> yes, I want that. Now when we enter into that by faith, Now it begins to work itself out in righteous actions. It's all good. This is so good. But we doubt it. Our human natures doubt it. We don't have to doubt that. That doubt is not your voice. That doubt for that message is not your voice. It's the voice of Satan. You don't have to listen to that. You don't have to listen to that. You can listen to God's word. God's word is special because when he speaks, it, becomes, it comes into existence. He's the one that says, let there be light, and there becomes light. He speaks into my life. He says, let my son's righteousness be birthed in you. And even though I don't see anything in me that's righteous, by that, receiving that word, it is created in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, amen, exactly. You know, Mrs. White, we have another part of our culture is that we, we, we fear emotion. <laughs> but Mrs. White says, when it comes to the themes of the cross, being unemotional is a sin. Wow. This is something we can get excited about. I am so excited. I'm more excited than I was. Anyway. Okay, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. I'm writing this letter to all the devoted believers who have been made holy by being one with Jesus, the Anointed One. How do we receive holiness? By being one with Jesus. And you're like, no, I can never be holy. Well, no, you can't be holy. It's Christ in you. His righteousness imputed to you means you're holy. Not, you don't have holy flesh. You'll have temptations. You'll have Satan bugging you every day of your life. You don't have to listen to him. This is God's word. This, this is God's word. Now the outworking of that, see, here's the deal. Here's the difference. Is like in the past, I would say I have to go through the Ten Commandments. I have to keep all the Ten Commandments in order so that I can become holy someday in the future, in the far future. <laughs> Whereas this says you start out here. You start out in the house. His righteousness is yours. 
Now you can relax and walk it out. You can take that righteousness. You can take that acceptance with the Father. You can take that presence of the Holy Spirit in your life by faith and then take that into your life. Take that into your world. And this is what Jesus was praying. I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, Thy kingdom come. This is your job. This is my job, is to bring the kingdom to bring heaven's realities, heaven's solutions into the world. So, the process is to go get some of that. Instead of focusing on obeying the Ten Commandments, let us look at the Ten Commandments and say, oh, this is what I can do, and focus on being one with Christ. Getting into his presence, spending time in his presence, spending time in his word, in his presence, spending time with him and seeing the heavenly things that he has, taking a hold of those and bringing those solutions into our dark and troubled world. This truth is the reason my wife and I are still married. It is. It is. I learned this when I was 34. Righteousness by faith. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There is no... There's, I'm sorry? And to cleanse you. Exactly. It's his work. He works through us. He does it in us. And as long as we are trying to do that, as long as we are trying to obey to gain his pleasure, to gain his approval, we will never become efficient laborers for him. Because we're stressed out and we start developing standards that are rigid and that are based on behavior and we don't see, we have a really hard time, when we start valuing people based on that standard. We walk out in the world and we see, oh, they've got Whoa, they've got makeup. Oh, they got earrings. Whoa, that's a mini skirt. They're not very valuable. They've got to go through all this to get to where I am, and God barely accepts me. See what I'm talking about? I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying that from my experience. I don't know. You guys are all think better than I do. But that was my experience. It's like, and to bring the gospel to somebody, there's so many things that they have to learn before they can really come and accept Christ. It's backwards. It's all backwards. But the truth set you free. So, once you get the idea that we have this righteousness, we have this acceptance in God, and by faith we can claim and we can come into His presence clean. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. He always does it. To Forgive us and to cleanse us. That's cool. Now, for me, I don't know about for you, but the cleansing took a while. But I had to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep confessing and keep claiming that promise that he would confess, uh, that he would cleanse. And it's step by step. And it's a growing process. Praise God. Praise God. That's the only way, that is the only way that true righteousness can really be worked out. Even Jesus, he says, abide in me as a vine cannot bear fruit unless it abides in me. So instead of focusing on keeping the commandments, we can focus on seeing Jesus. And by beholding him, we become changed into his likeness. You know, that's the pleasurable thing about being a believer is beholding him. Beholding him. And, and in this world, we've got so many distractions, especially now. If we put our minds, put our eyes on him, then that will be reproduced in our life. It's a miracle. Well, that's how he created the world. So that's how we should expect this to work, is by miracle. Daily, moment by moment, miracle. The miracles are easy for him. It's his nature. <laughs> we see miracles as divine in, in, interventions. 
So every once in a while, I say, oh, things are out of alignment. Oh, okay, put a miracle there. Okay, back in shape. No, he lives in miracles. God walks in miracles. Our breathing is a miracle. <sighs> okay, so then the righteousness gets applied. Like I said, I, many of you weren't here Wednesday night. Many of us pray, Lord, please come quickly because the world is full of pain. The sad thing is that the second coming of Jesus Christ is not a solution to that pain for them. It's an end game. They have no more chance. It shuts off all possibility of healing for them. That's not a solution. The gospel is a solution. And that's our job. Bringing his will, his kingdom into this world. Okay. Just set the stage real quick. Uh, more people living inside that circle than outside of it. Uh, each dot is, represents an un, a, a people group. The red dots represent unreached people groups. Anybody think that we're done? Good. <laughs> Another part of <clears throat> our giving. How are we doing on reaching those red dots? Um, we give about 64% of all of our giving to tithe another 35% to local church, and about 2% to our mission program. That's the culture that you and I inherit. That's where we are right now. The general uh, trend of our church, the sermons, the attitudes, the theology that we've developed, uh, make us feel good about not obeying God. We're doing just enough to feel like we're doing what we need to do. But the religion that we're enjoying today... It's not all that there is in the gospel. There's more. So let's look. How did we get into this situation? I uh, did a study from 1933 to 2005. Uh, this is a graph that, that, that tracks the tithe giving and is adjusted for inflation. During the 1900s, there was a tremendous growth in e econ e economy, economic, anyways, tr tremendous economical growth. <laughs> um, yeah, huge growth in economic... In, I believe that it, that is a result of the missionaries praying back in the 1800s for breakthrough so they could have funds, they could establish hospitals and churches and schools around the world. God gave them that, and um, you can see our local church budget kind of followed that same trend. But what happens to world missions? This is the culture that we've inherited Um, yeah. North American Adventist gives an average of So, you wonder why, you wonder where God might be judging us, you know. Uh, I, you know, repent, be zealous and repent, for I might spew you out of my mouth. Because God has blessed us so much, and what have we done with it? This is the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches is that the more we have, the less we feel like we have. Okay. So, that was the sermon. I'm going to shift. <laughs> uh, in the next few minutes, I believe one of our biggest uh, abilities and capabilities and opportunities in this COVID area when we can't fly to many countries overseas is our, the workers, the missionaries that we have there already. This is one of our Bible workers in India, another one there on the right. They already know the language. They don't need a, a flight ticket. They're living there already. For $90 a month, you can sponsor one of these people full-time. $90 a month. Last year, we saw that there was a need up in Punjab. The southern half of the entire state of Punjab had no Adventist presence whatsoever. None. And so we thought, man, we've got to do something about that. So we prayed. We joined forces with uh, Jamie George. He did a concert in, in uh, Collisdale. We raised the funds. We sent 20 Bible workers there in March. And the most recent report that we've gotten, they've already brought a family ready to be baptized. It's awesome. Okay, Kashmir. Anybody heard of Kashmir besides what you wear? Okay, we're going to go there right now. Some sound.
Sri Nagar, right there. Um, there was no Adventists in that, in that city. Uh, in the last few years, gospel outreach workers, uh, they've put a worker up in, in, the south, in, the, in the state just south of that in Jammu. And um, one of the guys from that city came down and he was converted. And so he went back up to Sri Nagar and he's been discipling. He's got seven other Bible workers, six other Bible workers ready to go. And so we have just sent them the word to hire those Bible workers and send them into that place. Bangladesh. Oh, wow. Okay, so this church had been closed for the last 20 years. Uh, some uh, wonderful organization came through and built these churches and had a five-year program, and then they turned it over to the local conference. Local conference doesn't have the money to support that, so they closed it. They've been closed and locked for the last 20 years. I'm not happy with that. So we um, just sent some money over to, we asked them to re repair that church, and they says, no, you can't repair that church. You have to build a new church. So I'm like, that's impossible. Those are expensive. And then the guy says, my, our worker over there says, well, actually, we can rebuild it with tin and wood for about the same price as you were going to repair this one for. So he says, go for it. And I'm not going to share the video because we're running out of time. Uh, the most recent, one of the most recent ones is in Taui Taui. Taui Taui is a little string of 300 islands in the southern Philippines, uh, the last tip before we run into Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, it's, it includes part of the mainland there. Uh, this is Pastor Rani Devera, and uh, I don't have time to show this. I apologize, but um, I, wanted, I do want to show you this next one because it's, uh, I think uh, we'd all kind of get a kick out of it. Yeah. Ang Philippines, they have this organization called the Sulads, 
and it's young people in college, in Mountain View College, and it's a volunteer organization. They go out to all these different mountain tribes and villages, and they uh, educate them, do education. In these, um, in these islands, it's all Muslim, okay? And what's interesting is that we are the only Christian religion accepted in those islands. We don't tell them we're Christian because in their mind, Christian means they eat pork, drink alcohol, do all that kind of stuff. We don't do that. So they say, are you Christian? No, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, what's the Seventh-day Adventist? Well, I don't eat pork. Oh, you know, and there's automatically that. And so our, these Sulads have been going into these islands, and the result of that is a lot less uh, murder. There's a lot more calmness. The, they used to say that the second wife of every Tawi Tawi man was, or the first one, yeah, second wife was his gun. First wife was the woman, the second wife was the gun, yeah. And because uh, there was a lot of murder. And there's amazing stories and miracles. So they've been, these Sulads have been doing this teaching in these remote islands, and they've been such a blessing there that now there's an open door for Bible workers to go in there and start establishing the work. And so we, I just, last week, and this is part of the work that we've been doing. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, yeah, go. It's another thing, because it's a faith thing, you know. If we say go, that means, you know, 10 Bible workers. In this area, the, he was asking for $300 per worker, which sounds like a lot for those that are used to sponsoring at $90 a month, but uh, $300 doesn't sound like if I have to, much if I have to live on that. But <laughs> this is more than their salary. This also allows them to do ministry as they go to these different places. And you can see the distances are so far, it's very expensive to travel. So by faith, we stepped out and says, yes, hire 10 Bible workers for this area. And so I'm excited because... Yeah, it's stressful to worry about the faith, I mean, the, the finances and everything, but the results, you know, that stress is temporary. If they win one soul, you know, according to the life of Christ, from the example we see in the life of Christ, it is worth an entire life of pain, suffering, hard work for one soul. Heaven would see that as a good investment. So if I end up, anyway, I won't go there. Yeah, this is one of the Sulads, and listen to what he says, why he's there. As Sulads missionaries, we left our home where we had a good life. And we came here because the Word of God motivated us, and because they have the right to the tree of life. Tree of life. They have the right to go to heaven and to meet the one who created them and saved them. What motivates me is that I want them to see, not only through the missionaries and through our teaching, but for them to see Jesus personally when he comes. We see that we have holiness through oneness with Christ. We see that he accepts us. And he accepts us just like the elder brother of the prodigal son. He was living with the father. He was obeying all of his commandments. He wasn't enjoying it. And when somebody came, when his, bro when his younger brother came back, he was angry. He was with the father, but he did not enter into the father's spirit. That's us. That's me. I'm the elder brother. The father said to the elder brother, everything that I have is yours. So if we have everything, what's holding us back from sharing it? Because when we share it, it doesn't go away. It multiplies. Let's share more. I just got an email. There's a little thumb in India that's between Nepal and Bhutan sticks up there. Um, it looks like this. Those of you that like mountains and cold weather, <laughs> they're asking for Bible workers. What do you think? I don't want to hear from you. <laughs> she always says yes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, this is what we're getting calls. 
We're getting calls for Bible workers every single day. We have 400 now. We could have 4,000 easily. Faith is the victory. If you want, if that's not challenging enough for you, I recommend the Maldives. <laughs> not for a vacation. <laughs> I was there. I don't have my picture. I was there uh, a year, a little over a year ago. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. Don't worry. <laughs> While I was there, the two days that I was there, I was the only Adventist in the country. Only Ad- I left. There's no Adventist there. Young people. You like challenge? Here's one for you. You young men, you know what's going to bring you happiness and joy in your life? Responsibility. A challenge. God gave you a warrior's heart. Become a warrior in Him. Take the brightness that God gives you and take it and smash that darkness. The darkness cannot overcome the light. There's three options for us. We can go, we can send, or we can disobey. And lo, I'm with you always. That's Jesus, that's not me. Okay, just want to make that clear. <laughs> um, do we sing or closing hymn? Okay, do you know which one that is? 608, anybody know that song? Okay, please stand after this long, boring sermon. Please stand and we will sing 608. As a group, as a, as, a, as a family here in Hayden Lake Church, Father, we receive your righteousness by faith. We thank you for it, Father. We praise you for it. And we know that your righteousness, your living, your dwelling in us will fulfill the law better than we ever could on our own. And Father, now that we are so filled, we're so rich, Father, open up a way. Teach us how to walk this out with you by our sides into the entire world, into the darkest place there is, knowing by faith you are there, you have the solution. 
Thank you for prayer. Thank you for this group. Thank you for the Hayden Lake SDA Church, for the pastor, for the elders, for the everybody that's here that's welcomed us so warmly. Father, we just present them to you and just ask for you to bless this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, potluck, not potluck, lunch is being served downstairs. It's free to everybody.